All right. Um, thank you for coming. This is Books and Barbells. This is our new health program where we talk all things nutrition and fitness. Uh, my name is Rory Martirana. I am an adult services librarian here at the Ives Main Library branch of the New Haven Free Public Library, um, downtown on the green. And today I'm joined by Elena Paravantes. And um, Elena is the founder of oliveTomato.com. She is the author of the Mediterranean Diet Cookbook for Beginners, which is right behind me. Mm -hmm. um, Elena is an award-winning registered dietitian, nutritionist, and writer specializing in the Mediterranean diet. She has been active in the field of food and nutrition for at least 20 years as a clinical dietitian, a food nutrition consultant, writer, teacher, lecturer, um, both in U.S. and Greece. Thank you so much, Elena, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Okay, so if you don't mind, can we start a little bit by talking a bit about your background with the Mediterranean diet? I know um, you grew up with it, so this is something that you're very familiar with. Uh, sure. Uh, so to start off, I should say I'm Greek American. So I was uh, born and raised in the US by Greek parents. So as many um, people who you know come from different countries, they try to preserve their traditions. So one of that was our food. So even though I was in the US, uh, we ate Greek food. And as we know, the Greek diet is the one of the prototypes of the Mediterranean diet. So having said that, yes, I was raised on this diet. Uh, I did move to Greece and I did spend time there every summer with uh, grandparents and the villages and in, in, in different locations. So I, I was able to see firsthand, you know, the Mediterranean diet in, you know, in real life rather than just reading it in a book. Uh, and now I have been living in Greece since um, oh, 20 years actually uh, this year. And um, we try as a family as well to follow the Mediterranean diet. Uh, which is the Greek diet for us. Um, and my experience is, is based on what I grew up with, with my parents, with my grandparents, with other elderly relatives. Uh, so I was able to see what they were, you know, the, that diet that we read about, people in their real, um, uh, I would say their, the environment, you know, in Greece, on an island, on a, in a village, on a mountain, that kind of thing. So. So I'm, uh, people who know me personally, I'm very into nutrition and healthy living and regular exercise. Uh, like I'm a weightlifter. Um, and I, and I'm like, personally, I have this mission against bad diets. So a lot of people assumed when I was doing this, that it might be a little hypocritical um, cause I'm always talking about fad diets and how they don't work and how, you know, it's, it's like deceptive mm -hmm. and there's a lot of fake stuff out there. Can you explain to other people who are anti diet, how, um, the Mediterranean diet, even though it has that name in it, um, how it sets itself apart from wellness fads? Uh, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so yes, it, it kind of gets, um, uh, grouped in with other diets. Uh, in fact, the word diet does come from the Greek word dieta, which means a lifestyle. So what sets it apart, first of all, it is a lifestyle, but most importantly, it's not a diet that somebody came up with to sell, you know, or it's not Weight Watchers or Atkins diet or something like this. It's a diet that existed naturally in a certain environment in certain parts of the world based on, you know, what was available and, um, you know, the seasons. So it's it's the opposite of a fad diet because you it's a way of eating. It's a way of living that is uh, basically you can follow it. For, you don't have to, you can follow it for the rest of your life. It's not a diet that's there for you to lose weight or do something like that, so. So the research on this type of lifestyle um, is really expansive and actually dates um, according to your to your cookbook, all the way back to the 40s. Um, what it's um, why do you think people like 
people seem to come to it and then have misconceptions still like, oh, it's all pasta or like I can't eat meat or cheese or like, why do you think something so, cause it's really one of the most well-researched diets or lifestyles out there. Why do you think there's so many misconceptions in spite of that? Well, one of the things that we probably don't talk about that much, there is a, even a misconception amongst researchers as to what a diet, a Mediterranean diet is. So many researchers have tried to come up, they have to enable to do their research uh, with a questionnaire that uh, participants can answer and they can they, you know, give them a score of how much they uh, follow the Mediterranean diet. It's not easy to, to take a diet that existed naturally in certain parts of the world, which is a little bit different in Italy, a little bit different in Greece, and put it in a questionnaire. So uh, this is a post-war diet. People ate like this because they had to, but it just happened to be very tasty. So the fact that they didn't eat a lot of meat is because they just didn't have meat, you know, or another part of the diet that we overlook is the fasting that a lot of in Greece, um, for religious reasons, people fasted from animal products for 200 days a year. So that probably played a role too. They were kind of accidental vegans in a way. So the misconception is probably in the definition. And nowadays, you know, we read about the Mediterranean diet and it seems like people have this generic definition, you know, fish and vegetables and a bit of olive oil, but it's a bit more specific. And that's, that's what I tried to do in the book as well. And on my side, I try to, to provide some more guidance rather than generalities of, you know, healthy eating and, you know, but yeah, it, so there, there are a lot of misconceptions. I, I haven't, you know, touched on it that much yet, but um, yeah. Um, so we have a question from Phyllis who asks if you could please discuss the way, how this way of eating works for diabetics. Okay. Well, actually this diet, the Mediterranean diet has had a lot of research behind it in terms of diabetes. Uh, it's considered a a very good diet to follow for diabetes. And there's a misconception among patients many times that you can't eat carbohydrates. Uh, but in fact, you do. You just need to spread them out a little bit or you should eat whole grains. Now, the Mediterranean diet has actually had studies that show that people who follow it can either reduce their risk of getting it, but also if they already have diabetes and they're taking medication, they can actually reduce the medication they're taking by following a Mediterranean diet. So I wouldn't say something specific other than the diet in itself is pretty balanced. People assume it's a high carbohydrate diet because we think of pasta, but in fact, it's a moderate carbohydrate diet. It ranges at around 40 to 45% carbohydrates when you do it the right way. So uh, keeping in mind, you know, the rules for diabetics and for everybody that we should eat every, you know, three times a day, we should combine, you know, have some carbohydrates, uh, prefer whole grain carbohydrates. The rest of the diet in itself is exactly what um, a diabetic would need and help to keep their blood sugar in, in control. Um, let's see, so, oh, Susan says, love your site, Elena. Have been reading your newsletter for several years. Excited to hear you today. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you have a lot of fans. <laughs> this is, I, I appreciate having the opportunity also to talk here and answer any questions they have. So yeah, I yeah. want to thank them. <laughs> people seemed really excited about this. So I'm glad that you're here. Um, you mentioned uh, in the intro to your book that only certain areas of the Mediterranean follow this diet. Um, can you talk about that a tiny bit? Well, yeah, that, that's a bit, I, some people find it a bit controversial because what, what I mean by that is, and I'm going through the studies, uh, we have studies mainly, real studies now, not just, you know, we kind of eat the same things. Uh, Italy and Greece, those are the main areas um, where the research has focused initially to, you know, to set up what is a Mediterranean diet. And if we look at the in, in the 90s, the Harvard and Old Ways, which is a nonprofit organization that promotes 
um, different food cultures, but started with the Mediterranean diet, their definition does say uh, Southern Italy and Greece. Those are the countries that this diet was based on. So when we're talking about this type of diet, that's we're talking about something specific, not Mediterranean cuisine, which is something different because many countries don't consume that much olive oil that are around the Mediterranean. Others don't consume wine. Others have a lot of meat in their diet. So you can't really say that a specific country who has very low intake of olive oil follows a Mediterranean diet just because they border the Mediterranean. But yeah, there are some common uh, aspects to the cuisine, that's for sure. So Sherry has a, has a question slash comment for you. Um, I'm so glad I found Olive Tomato. I was using your okay. recipes from the blog before the book came out and I see some of those made it into the book while others like the tahini toast didn't. I'm wondering how you made those kinds of decisions about what to put in the book and what didn't make it in. Uh, yeah, I wish I could put all the, <laughs> the, the recipes. We had, to, we, we had set a number of 100 recipes and I was trying to um, get a variety of each food group. So we have, or meal, let's say breakfast, uh, lunch, dinner. I really wanted to add more of the vegetarian or vegetable-based main courses. That was what I wanted to put the most importance on. So uh, maybe next time, maybe I'll have another book and I can focus more on breakfast foods because I know a lot of people uh, have questions and need ideas about what to eat for breakfast on a Mediterranean diet. I had promised my boss I would talk to you about olive oil. <laughs> He, um, uh, so he's I always happy. talking about this Greek olive oil that he gets from Astoria, Queens. Oh, um, great. But I wanted to ask you, um, is there like a difference between like Greek olive oil, EVOO, regular olive oil? Um, because I, I mean, it, I don't know. It's probably like a weird question. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it's a question, you know, we get a lot. Um, what happens is, so obviously many countries make olive oil. Uh, I'm not gonna say one is better than the other. I consider the best olive oil, the olive oil that, that is the freshest. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is the fresher the olive oil, the higher the level of antioxidants in that olive oil. So as the olive oil sits, you know, it's gonna lose its antioxidants. So you want, if you live in California and they make olive oil there, which they do, then try and find one that has, you know, you can see sometimes the date where they, um, the harvest date. So when they pick the olives and then after, usually right away is the best, they make the olive oil. Uh, so extra virgin olive oil is the olive oil that has no processing. So olive oil is made by squeezing oil out of olives. Now, sometimes they may heat those olives to get more oil out of it. And sometimes they don't. So when they don't, we call it cold pressed olive oil because there's not that much of a temperature. And you wanna prefer that as well because it, again, it has higher levels of these antioxidants and other protective substances. I, apart from that, regular olive oil is often bad olive oil that's been highly processed to remove like unwanted flavors or uh, off tastes and then mixed with some other olive oil to give it, you know, a better taste or a better color. So you're not going to get the benefits. That's the problem. And we see now from re studies that uh, it, in, in the U.S., the sales of that type of olive oil has gone up. And that's not a good thing, in my opinion, because you're not getting the benefits that you want. You're not getting those antioxidants by using regular or light uh, olive oil. So the difference is in the processing. So extra virgin olive oil is the olive oil that has no process, you know, other than mechanical, you know, you, you, you have to squeeze the oil out of the olive. So is I hope that, that helps. Is it possible to make it at home or? Um, no, well, you need these, to. they have these mills. Yeah, I yeah. mean, my family makes their own olive oil, but you can, you might have your own mill or, the village where you are might have a communal mill. So everybody takes their olives and then they take their olive oil. And um, so, yeah, it's, you can't make it really uh, at home. <laughs> um, so I hadn't realized that um, a Mediterranean type diet was so plant-based and you kind of touched on this a little bit before, 
my dad's mm-hmm. Italian, so we oh. eat a lot of Italian <laughs> food, but he loves his meat. So yes. it's always right. got a meat in it, right? Um, but this one actually um, seems very vegan friendly. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit. I'm in New Haven and there are a lot of vegans here. <laughs> Um, how mm-hmm. it could how it could um, work with their with their dietary restrictions. So about I would say about I th- I've written it on the description about sixty five percent of the recipes are vegetarian uh, in the book or vegan I think. Um, what happens is we had a, the the Greek cuisine specifically had a lot of vegan dishes because they were fasting, so they couldn't eat meat they couldn't eat dairy. They could eat some seafood, like shrimp, things like this. So they had to have all these vegan recipes. Some of them didn't even use olive oil. Like it was a very strict uh, fast. But as you mentioned, your dad, um, Greek people, even those that followed this Mediterranean diet and lived all these you know, years, love meat, but it was scarce. So if, you, if they had the choice, yes, they would eat meat every day. But because of the the situation they didn't so but now we can take that and use it to our advantage and follow that diet as they were they were they were not eating meat because they just didn't have it we're choosing to reduce our meat now because we know what you know how it affects our health environment for whatever reason but the truth is a lot of greeks that immigrated to the u.s changed their diet when they came here and they ate a lot of meat because it was affordable they could eat it Uh, So we have a question from Rachel. She says, can you help me understand how much cow dairy is okay? For example, I eat whole plain Greek yogurt with fruit or for breakfast, but how much is okay daily? So to start, uh, generally in the Mediterranean diet, they didn't consume cow milk. So they consumed products made from goat milk or sheep's milk. That's what was available there. So if you could move toward that way, it would be beneficial because the nutrition um, value is different. So for example, sheep's milk has higher amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, So that would be one thing. But generally I would focus on getting my dairy from yogurt or from cheese. And I would limit that to two to three servings a day which is, you know, a cup of milk or 30, an ounce of uh, cheese or about a cup of uh, yogurt. But if you can move towards something more like goat or sheep, that would be even better. So Linda asks, we've been following the diet since January and doing pretty well, but struggling with getting more vegetable-based meals. Any tips on how to add them? Uh, just cook them. That's That's my... So in the book and in my side, I have a lot of the vegetable casseroles that we, uh, these are usually cooked with uh, herbs and spices and tomato and wheat. So the, when you cook vegetables, they, you know, they reduce in, um, in their size. So you can eat a lot more of them. So you end up eating like a pound of vegetables in one sitting without getting so many calories. And so we have these type of vegetable dishes as a main course, rather than using some vegetables as a side course and then putting a little bit of meat or pasta. So you might have a meal, let's say, which is uh, made from green beans or peas. And some of you who have followed my diet, my book or my website know these recipes. And we eat that with some feta cheese and a slice of bread. And it's a whole meal. And so you've basically consumed three or four servings in one day and you don't have to worry the rest of the day to, you know, trying to get more salad or something else. So that would be my suggestion. And I have some uh, posts on my site if you search how to eat more vegetables with more tips. Um, Christina says, hello, Alina, it's wonderful to meet you. I wanted to ask what your favorite recipe that you put in the book is and um, that you have with your family. Okay, well, let me. Or maybe that's I have two to different say, recipes. I have the book, yeah, I mean, I have a few. My one of my favorites is not in the book, but it's in my website. Um, on my website, but one of my favorite ones is the eggplant recipe. That's um, 
stuffed eggplant with uh, tomato and onion, which has kind of been caramelized. And then you put some feta on it and it's, it's really nice in the summer. Uh, so I would say that's, that's my number one in this, in this book. Otherwise, on my rest on my site, it's my uh, stuffed tomatoes, which are stuffed with rice, and uh, it's a uh, my mother's recipe. So, um, let me see. So, we sort of touched base on this a little bit, but more Western culture type um, eating plans are all about protein and low fat, especially like being in the fitness community. All I hear all the time is like more protein, more protein, more protein, uh, fewer carbs um, and, and low to no fat. Um, it's, this is so different. And I tried some of the recipes and like, you know, they're, they're great. And I don't really feel, you know, less healthy or less strong. So um, can you, Yes. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. Uh, that well, that, that's a generally a misconception that we registered dietitians always have to like explain uh, the protein issue. First of all, not everybody needs that much protein. You know, unless you're doing heavy weightlifting, you're not going to need more than a gram per kilogram of weight. So, you know, we're already getting, we don't get protein only from meat. You know, we can get it from even bread, vegetables, of course, dairy, nuts, you know, plant nuts. Now with the fat, uh, what we used to think, like if you're younger, but in the 90s, it was like low fat, there were all these yeah. uh, snack wells and the, you know, and people were gaining weight because they were eating low fat and high carbohydrate. So we now know that fat does not make us fat. So especially if it's good fat, like olive oil or from avocados or nuts. We know that that fat keeps us full. And what, what I do with the diet and what I was trying to do with the book as well is combine a moderate fat diet with moderate carbohydrates. Protein is normal in this diet. So that way, if you have a lot of, you have good fat, you're not that hungry to start eating carbohydrates. Um, having said that, somebody who's in, professional sports, yes, they would need a little bit more careful planning, you know, before and after their workouts. But the average person is working out following just a regular Mediterranean diet, um, not being afraid of the fat, because the more fat you have, your carbs will go down a little bit. And that will help you to lose weight if that's what you're trying to do as well. Mm. I think also people don't understand that there are good fats. Yes. Um, and kind of as women, we need a little bit more fat. Um, like I know if you're under fat, you can lose your, you can use your, your menstrual cycle. You could like exactly. lose a baby in a pregnancy. So um, that's something that's an important to remember too. Exactly. Uh, Rachel, Rachel has different tastes than me, but Rachel asks, <laughs> how do you enjoy coffee in the morning without sugar or dairy? Uh, plain coffee just isn't desirable. Well, I would start by saying having a, a teaspoon of sugar in the morning, if you're really not having a lot of su sweets the rest of the day is, is okay. I mean, at some point, you know, that's not going to affect your diet in the long run, that small amount. But something else I do is I, if I want to have coffee without sugar, I might eat something with it. So that kind of breaks the bitterness of the coffee. Like, you know, I'm having my toast and a sip of coffee that way, you know, it, um, otherwise, I personally add a teaspoon of sugar in my coffee in the morning. So, and it is also something, uh, I discussed this as well, Greek coffee, uh, which is actually studies have shown that is associated with longevity that we've seen in one of the blue zones, which is uh, uh, Ikaria. It's, it's one of the Greek islands that is one of the blue zones that we hear about people living long lives. Uh, they do drink this Greek coffee and they, they do have it with a little bit of sugar. So I wanted you to, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about those blue zones too. Like um, okay. there's that village in Italy with the highest concentration of like centenarians in the world. Okay. Um, I know that sort of um, baffled researchers for a while, but would you suspect that maybe their diet, because those places follow this, 
this diet as well, right? Would you suspect exactly. that that might be a part of it? So yeah, I focused on the Greek blue zone, which is another island where people live until they're 100. Uh, and so what we, what we when I looked at this, what I understood is that diet they're following is what most Greeks were following in the 60s. So the thing, my grandparents, you know, my grandfather lived till he was 104, my great grandfather till 100. And so I looked at, there's that commonality. So yeah, they do follow a very plant-based diet. And one of the things that they do that we don't is they eat a lot of wild plants. So they forage greens and they boil them. We call them korta in, in Greek. And you boil these greens and you add olive oil and you just, those are full of antioxidants and omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, they drink a lot of these wild. So they make uh, herbal teas as well. Uh, but it is also genetic. These areas don't have a lot of mix, like the DNA stays within that area, let's say. So in the, on this Greek island, for example, there's not a lot of tourism. People don't really, you know, there's still, they don't have many processed foods available as much. And they, they, they do follow the fasting where they don't eat. So it's a combination and the lifestyle, of course, you know, it's not just the diet, it's they take naps every day. Uh, they have their, their, the social aspect or going to church, they have their festivals. So it's a combination which is common in all those areas around the world. Maybe the diets differ a little bit, but so, yeah. So Phyllis says, I've seen on your website, a product called barley rusks. How do you use them? They look like a crunchy roll. Yes. So these uh, are, barley rusks are traditionally from the island of Crete, which was the main island where all the research started. And so what they used is they use barley flour and they make these, they double bake these, it's like, bread it's very hard if you eat it as is you're gonna you know you might break your teeth so we usually soak that in a little bit of water and a little bit of olive oil and then you might um, top it off with fresh chopped tomato cucumber drizzle it with some olive oil some oregano and you have a salad which i i do have in my uh book as well i call it a cretan salad but I also give the alternative of using uh, like a different type of um, crisp that would be available in the US. Uh, here, you know, if you are in Greece, you should buy these rusks. They have a long shelf life and, and they're very healthy. Uh, they're usually 100% whole grain barley flour or with a combination of barley and whole grain wheat. And someone says they get them, Susan gets them on Amazon from Crete. So, uh, oh. and I do have a recipe on the site as well. Can you talk a little bit about your site? Cause, um, so I might be living under a rock, but I, I got your cookbook and I was very excited about it, but I hadn't known about you before then. Um, yeah, yeah. but apparently the site's been for a while. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like when you decided sure. to start it and that sort of thing? Sure. Um, so when I moved to Greece, I started working in uh, magazines, writing about nutrition. I was a nutrition editor for prevention and men's health, the Greek editions. Uh, and what I noticed, there was a lot uh, reading the, the media outside of Greece, there was misconceptions about the Mediterranean diet. At some point I thought, you know, I need to start writing about this for not Greek people, for people outside of Greece. And that's how olive tomato started and I was sharing recipes or, you know, uh, information about, you know, the real, the authentic Mediterranean diet. So um, I can say, you know, the, the website has become a source of an authentic Mediterranean diet, you know, and, and I do include recipes that I grew up with that have been passed down through my family. And I started it, it's almost 10 years now. Yes. Susan asks, uh, the cooking time for many of the casseroles and potato dishes seems a lot longer than what we're used to here in the US. Can you say something about what the extended cooking time does? So 
basically we when we when you have a main course casserole you know with beans or uh, zucchini or eggplant we we like to cook it until it is velvety that's the word i would use and because you have olive oil you want all that you want it to be a, a smooth uh, texture. You, you're not eating crunchy green beans. This, it needs to be like, almost like how you would consider a risotto. You know, it's smooth, it's velvety. So that's the reason why we, we cook it more. Now, having said that, there's some olive oil that gets absorbed. And when you cook tomato with olive oil, you actually increase the amount of antioxidants you absorb. So there is a nutritional benefit as well as a flavor one. Can we talk a little bit about the health benefits of a Mediterranean diet? I know you've mentioned like diabetes and a couple others. Um, you had a whole big list in the cookbook of things and some of them were not so surprising like you would expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course that's better. Um, and some were surprising, like I think depression is in there. Um, would that be because of the, the lifestyle aspect, the regular exercise and socializing and taking care of yourself? Um, and what other types of health benefits there might be for people who maybe aren't familiar with yeah. this way of, of living and eating? Great question. So yes, I mean, we, we know the Mediterranean diet as the heart healthy diet, that it's one of the original, uh, that, that was the initial benefit that they had found. Um, but moving forward, and we know it protects from certain types of cancer as all plant-based diets do. Uh, one of the things though, that we've been seeing in the last few years is this research about how it affects cognitive ability and it can protect from Alzheimer's disease and how it affects mood. So yes, it is the lifestyle, but there are certain um, foods, for example, omega-3 fatty acids. We don't consume that many anymore. Um, in the traditional Mediterranean diet, we know that they, not only did, they, it's not that they consumed a lot of fish, but they consumed small fatty fish, the sardines and the anchovies, which I know a lot of people don't like or they can't find fresh. So, but those, they consume that. They consumed a lot of those greens, which were also rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Now, omega-3 has been shown that it can benefit our mood uh, or our cognitive ability. So there's a lot of research coming out now looking at that and uh, providing a way for, as we grow old, to follow a diet like this because it can protect us from cognitive disorder or memory loss. This is, this is very important, but it, is, it has to do with the interaction of the um, uh, nutrients in the diet and these antioxidants, which we, some of them we haven't even discovered yet, so. Um, Catherine asks, what are the different greens boiled to make horta? Mm -hmm. So one of the ones that you could probably find in your backyard and uh, a lot of people who grew up in the US with Greek parents will remember. Um, I remember my mother and my grandmother when they were in the US, they picked the dandelions from the backyard. And, you know, we think of them as weeds. We want to get rid of them. But dandelions are one uh, type of green that you can lightly boil, serve with olive oil and lemon and with some feta cheese. In the book, I have it served over like a piece of bread, you know, if you want it like a toast, let's say. Uh, collard greens is something one can use. Beet greens are also something we consume a lot. So the green part of the beet. Um, and then any type of green, you know, kale or spinach, you know, just try and get those greens in there at least, you know, three times a week would be, you know, even as a salad. But boiling them, you can eat a lot more, you know, you have a big bag of them and they, you know, when you boil them down, there's almost, you know, like a cup left. So, yeah. And let's see, we have another question. Um, hello, we've been using your recipes since being diagnosed with high cholesterol. It's come down quite a bit. As a dietitian, is there a cholesterol level you would recommend to be at or under? That's from Jim. Um, no, just, you know, whatever the standards are and what your doctor recommends. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, 
you just want to be below the the highest you know the point that is standard so i wouldn't recommend anything uh, specific um sherry sherry asks it's really hard to find the kind of whole grain bread here in rochester um that I would consider healthy, what ingredients should I be looking for and or avoiding when looking at bread labels? So yeah, that's that's a difficult situation here in Greece as well. Uh, so you want to avoid the Wonder Bread type of bread. Even, you know, sometimes we see whole grain bread that's so soft and fluffy, it has to make you wonder. Uh, what you want to look at basically, bread should just have flour, salt, and yeast. Those are the three ingredients that good bread should have. Uh, if they have, you know, they might have, so, uh, you know, um, sugar or some type of syrup or fat, uh, that shouldn't be in the, or preservatives. You know, I, I buy bread that is, you know, just the salt and the flour and the yeast and I put it in the refrigerator and it lasts. So that's what you should be looking for. Even if it has some white flour in it, it's better than the pseudo whole wheat bread that has all these other ingredients. Um, all right, so you have so many questions. <laughs> Let's see. Um, da, 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 Christina has been waiting a while. So Christina asks what drinks you might recommend in a Mediterranean diet. Uh, also, do you recommend having more water? And if so, how much water is a, is a good amount? Uh, so yeah, we we like our water in Greece. You 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 get water. You get you go for a coffee. They bring you water. Uh, you sit down before you've ordered anything. You know everybody. Water is the main drink if you're not drinking wine, let's say. So the only drinks I recommend is either water if you're an adult and if you do drink wine and herbal beverages. So herbal beverages are a big thing in the sense that we have a lot of um, the wild plant beverages. We have a tea we call mountain tea, which yes, you can find on Amazon as well. Uh, as well as chamomile, we, we drink oregano, uh, steeping it as a tea. But we drink this maybe twice a day, even if we're fine. It's not just if we have a cold or not feeling well. So those teas though, also have antioxidants in them. So I would recommend that as well. Uh, of course, you know, once in a while, somebody wants a soft drink or juice or something, yes. But on a regular basis, usually it's water or some wine with, with the meal. Um, okay. Uh, an anonymous question, does this lifestyle help with inflammation? Yes, it's considered an, an anti-inflammatory diet. Yeah, a lot of the, the um, foods, because it is plant-based and we know that plant-based uh, plants fight inflammation. Uh, so definitely, but you need to have plants in that diet, a lot of vegetables and uh, greens and fruit. Uh, are there, there are certain recipes for breakfast, Christina wants to know from the book that you would you would recommend? Um, I, I do have quite a few with with the eggs, with eggs in them. So I, I wanted to give that choice. Uh, but I do like um, one of the ones that maybe people don't necessarily is the um, bulgur wheat. So bulgur wheat is a is a whole grain, and we often you know oatmeal is great too. But I would recommend trying a different grain in your breakfast um, and kind of maybe staying away from dairy or things like that if, just to try out what it feels like. Because I know some people, you know, can't tolerate dairy in the morning. So I would recommend trying that recipe. It's a bit uh, not, or it's out of the ordinary, let's say. Uh, Catherine said that the, there's an exciting growing body of research linking diet to mental health, especially regards to depression. So she thanks us for, for bringing that up. Um, someone else just said bulgur wheat is delicious. Um, let's see. As far as pasta goes, um, this is a question from Rachel. Do you recommend basic pasta or other types? Great question. So some recipes, um, 
and this I need to, there's a misconception that in the Mediterranean diet, people used whole grain pasta. The fact is it didn't exist. Uh, you know, Italians, you just didn't have that kind of pasta. And so um, some recipes need to have that, you know, the regular white pasta. Having said that, in a traditional Mediterranean diet, you don't consume that much pasta. And so you might have it as a main course once a, once a week, like pasta and, you know, uh, meat, for example, or uh, pasta and tomato sauce. But generally pasta in Italy in particular, they eat it as a first course. It's just a small little amount. So eating it that way is okay. Um, what I see a lot in many Mediterranean recipes or Mediterranean spider recipes is they mix the vegetables with the pasta. And that's not what you wanna do. You just wanna have a 100% vegetable-based meal if you're gonna have that. Uh, if you do like pasta though, and you eat it more often, yes, I would recommend other types, uh, more so whole grain, not the bean or made with other ingredients. I would just stick to whole grain uh, wheat pasta if you don't have any um, allergies to that. Um, so you have a whole section in the cookbook on what to eat and how often to eat it. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a little rundown of sort of like the macronutrients, which uh, I'll, I'll let you explain what that means, but you know, sort of like how sure. much, how much of each you need to aim for in a day and are the, are the meal times any different than the Western type of eating? So generally uh, we can start with the meal times. Breakfast isn't really a big meal and um, I was mentioning this in a, in a post and a reader said very correctly, she mentioned how we almost do a, a type of intermittent fasting in a way because we eat a small breakfast and then you might eat a bigger meal a bit later, like at 11. Mm -hmm. And then your main meal is usually around three. And at, in the evening, it's a light meal. So it's a bit different, but I do know that people's lifestyles, you know, you can't eat your main meal, you know, at lunch at two or three because that you're working at that time. So um, that's how it is here. And if you can do that sometimes or during the weekend, or if you're a freelancer and your schedule allows you to eat a nice big meal at two in the, uh, two in the afternoon, because that's normal meal time here in the Mediterranean, then do it. But again, you wanna adjust it to your own schedule. Now macronutrients, we refer to carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And as I mentioned before, fat can reach to about 40%. I mean, in Crete, where they consume a lot of olive oil, it can reach 45% of the diet. If you're just eating vegetables and olive oil, you are hardly getting any carbohydrates. So your, your percentages go up. Um, and so, I clarify that because I know a lot of people are worried that there's too many carbohydrates in the Mediterranean diet and they won't lose weight or it's gonna be bad for their diabetes. But the fact is that they've done studies and they found that a range of about 40 to 45% of carbohydrates is ideal. Too low and you also have health issues and you actually live less, that's what they've found. Too much, obviously again, 70% is not a good level. And I, I can tell you that we, we've been taught, you know, as dietitians as well, that it should be like 60%, 70% carbohydrates. We now know that that's not the ideal percentage. Uh, so in the book, I do recommend serving sizes for each food group, uh, which again can be adjusted based on your calorie level. Uh, but what you don't want to reduce generally are the plants. So you can keep your plants at the levels I recommend, and then maybe you can reduce other things to play with your calorie level. Um, would you would you say that frozen veggies that are just like, you know, frozen broccoli in, in a bag in the freezer section of the grocery store, is there a like um, nutrient wise a disadvantage to getting those as opposed to fresh stuff? Uh, no, uh, I'm not, you know, if I have fresh vegetables available, I'm going to go and get them. But I do uh, have frozen vegetables and I'll make a quick, you know, 
green pea casserole or green beans casserole. Uh, because what happens is these vegetables are usually harvested right at their peak and then they're frozen right away. Mm -hmm. So they preserve the nutrients that they have. Uh, okay, flavor wise, sometimes texture wise, they're not gonna yes. be the same as fresh. The flavor is not as great. But I, I know like when I started eating healthier, because I used to just eat junk all the time, my groceries got a lot more expensive because I spent a lot of time um, shopping the perimeter of the store and especially the produce mm -hmm. section. Um, so I was wondering about that because I started buying a lot of frozen things just because they keep longer and they seem to be less expensive um, if I'm missing out on something that way. Yes, that, that, that's a, that is an issue. Um with the price of fresh produce. I mean, and it is a bit ironic that this diet that we're talking about today can be expensive for somebody when in fact it was a diet of poor people. It was a diet of post-war. And so now people have to spend all this money to buy fresh vegetables. Um, I have to say from a point in Greece, vegetables are not expensive. So it is very easy to get the fresh vegetables. But again, I'm gonna say, you know, certain vegetables you can get frozen, like broccoli, green beans, um, cauliflower, uh, peas. Uh, some though, like a good tomato, you know, it, you can only get it in the summer and, it, you know. Fresh. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it's okay to use frozen as long as there's no other ingredients added to it. Um, so if anyone has any questions, we're sort of approaching the hour. Um, try to get those in. Uh, Sherry would like to know any tips for single people in terms of menu planning? Sure, okay. So um, going back to those casseroles and um, you'll find them on my site and in the book, these casseroles actually taste better like the next day. They actually last three or four days. So if you make something like that, you could, you know, stretch it out. Like sometimes I'll, I'll have it, you know, I'll make, um, let's say lentils. Uh, and then the next day I'll have the lentils as a salad, as opposed to a soup, like I'll make it a bit thicker. Uh, but again, all the recipes can be adjusted. Most of the bean recipes and the, um, I have savory pie recipes, all those freeze very well. And what I do is I'll make a savory pie like spanakopita, which is spinach pie, and cut it in, in pieces and wrap it and freeze it. And then all you have to do is take out a couple, you know, put them in the oven. And so you can adjust things and you can, you know, not waste food, let's say. Um, so Helen, I asks, and I think this goes back to the frozen food question, are canned veggies okay? as well. Canned veg, uh, that, that's an issue in terms of um, the flavor and the texture. I, I have certain bean vegetables and I know that some people will use canned beans and it, it's just not the same because you're cooking the beans with another ingredient that you want it to absorb while it's cooking. So that might be an issue um, in terms of the texture and and the nutrient value. It's not the same as frozen and they do add sometimes preservatives or salt. You can get low salt ones, but in terms of uh, quality and texture and flavor, it's, it's I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, we'll have one more question from Christina and then I'm, I'm gonna cut it off after that. Um, this okay. is a good question though to end with because it has to do with dessert. Um, oh, okay. What would you recommend for more consumption of fruits in a Mediterranean diet? And I would love to know what healthy desserts you would recommend. Um, I have a feeling that they might go <laughs> hand in hand. So how to, the question if I understood was how to get more veg, more fruit more in the fruit. diet. Okay, yeah. so typically we finish a meal with fruit in Greece. So after your lunch, you're gonna eat fruit. After dinner, you're gonna eat fruit. Uh, so kind of fruit comes there without it being like, oh, now I have to eat my fruit for my snack. It just comes automatically. But uh, I'm not a big fan of putting fruit in a smoothie because I feel like you're not getting the uh, satiety and you don't feel like you've really consumed something, you've drank something. So I would try and just attach it to the meal at the end of the meal if you're trying to get more fruit. 
Uh, in terms of dessert, a lot of the desserts are made with olive oil. So um, what I would recommend is like uh, in, in the book, I have a walnut cake, which does have a syrup. So you put a syrup and then it absorbs it. But if you want, you can just make it without the syrup. So it's kind of like a, like a banana bread type of thing, but it's made with walnuts and olive oil. So you're getting, you're getting some carbs, but you're getting also good fats as well. So I would recommend something like that. Um, thank you again, Elena. This has been so terrific to talk to you. Um, uh, just a couple notes for people. The, the event today was made possible by gifts to our New Haven Free Public Library Foundation. And if you enjoyed it, please consider making a donation at nhfpl.org backslash donate to help support the collections, programs, and services of the library through the year. Again, Alina's book is called The Mediterranean Diet for Beginners. Um, we have it available at the library here, but if you're not local or you would like a copy of your own, we definitely encourage you to grab a copy. Um, it's terrific. I borrowed it from the library, but I will be buying one because it's so great. Um, if you enjoyed this program, also please join me again on June 2nd at noon for the next Book of and Barbells. I will be chatting with another nutrition expert, um, more uh, centered on fitness, Michelle Vadraska about fitness, nutrition, and meal prep for strength training in particular. Um, I really want to thank my supervisor, Seth Godfrey, for making this um, recurrent event a reality. It's been a dream of mine for a while, and uh, we finally got it going. Also, big thanks to Shannon Carter, who's been manning the tech aspects behind the scenes today, and to all of the adult services staff for your support, and especially big thanks to, to you, Elena, for, for coming and sharing your time with us today. Um, Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having me. She, it was a she's pleasure. in Greece, so I wish I I wish I were in Greece right now. Well, we're uh, opening. We're opening soon. But uh, yeah, if you're here, give me a call. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. This has been terrific. If you ever, you know, have another cookbook or anything, please, uh, we're happy to have you again. And and guys, check out uh, Elena's website, olivetomato.com. Um, terrific recipes on there. And uh, it's just been lovely chatting with you today.